Hi there, friends. I'm Vasco. I'm part of the team behind the first global Scrum Master Summit. If you're a Scrum Master, the Scrum Master Summit is a place to learn, to share, and to meet new friends. We will have lots of live sessions where you can meet and network with other Scrum Masters from all over the globe. So make sure you check it at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit and the numeral 21. That's bit.ly forward slash SMSUMMIT21. We have seven amazing keynotes or more as we are still organizing the conference as I record this and eight tracks that feature people like you and thought leaders sharing their insights and knowledge to help you become an awesome Scrum Master. So once again, check it out at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit 21. That's all lowercase, all one word, SM Summit and the numeral 21. I'll see you on the virtual conference floor. All right, now on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our TGIF and Product Owner episode this week with Susanna Chambers. Hi, Susanna. Welcome back. Hi, Vasco. Thank you for having me. So on the TGIF episode, uh, which is also the Product Owner episode, we talk about uh, great product owners and also, and we'll start with that, anti-patterns in the Product Owner role. So Susanna, share with us what might have been the worst anti-pattern you've witnessed in that Product Owner role. Well, I mentioned earlier in the week, one of the worst anti-patterns was around rather than protecting the team from unfair criticism, actually turning around and finger pointing and blaming the team um, when the PO felt that they were not getting the interaction with the stakeholder that they needed. But an alternative example that I thought was really unfortunate as an anti-pattern was where the product owner actually did mean a behavior from a good place, but it ended up backfiring. So in an attempt for them to try and reduce the burden, or so they thought for a team, they ended up having conversations in complete isolation on one aspect of developing a product. And what it meant was that the product owner and the stakeholders all felt as if they were all on the same page and they knew what was happening. But the product owner had not fed anything back to the team, to the actual development team. So rather than actually helping them and rather than shielding them and protecting them from unnecessary distractions and interruptions, it ended up badly impacting on the team's ability to be ready to pivot because when a change was then needed, they had no prior understanding or knowledge about what the product owner had discussed with the stakeholders, which was, of course, very problematic. So the team was, if I understand correctly, taken by surprise by uh, whatever change it was that the product owner was working on together with the stakeholders. How, how did that then work out? Like what, how did the team react and how did the conversation ensue from that point? Um, well, it was it was very, very difficult. And in this team, um, it, it had been quite challenging, you know, team health wise to build up psychological safety. Um, and luckily, at the point where this actually transpired, um, the team had got to a point where they had started calling out things that they did not feel were appropriate. OK, in terms of their team voice. So luckily, at least when this emerged, there were a couple of voices in the team that said, not not as a criticism of the PO, but said, well, we didn't know anything about this. So that was progress, at least, because a few months prior to that, they probably would not have even called that out. You know, they probably would have just said, oh, OK, we've got to do this then. But of course, that's not a, a very empowering position for a team to be in. So that was a good thing that they did feel able to point out and make it visible. Um factually, we did not know about this. Yes, okay, we'll pivot, but there needs to be recognition of the fact that we had no prior knowledge of this. And credit to the product owner, the product owner actually did, and that was in the context of a sprint retro, the product owner actually did admit failure. They did admit that that was uh, actually 
unhelpful to the team to have been having those conversations in isolation. Um, but then it was great because as a scrum master through the retro conversations, we were able to converge around a conversation that saw that the team understood that the product owner had not intended to keep them out of the picture um, you know, for a bad reason, but that they had actually been trying to reduce the burden on the team. But on that occasion, it just not had worked out. And unfortunately, both parties ended up uh, worse off for it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's great that they were able to have that conversation in that retrospective, of course, as we as Scrum Masters, as we tend to be aware of what's going on, like, what can we do as Scrum Masters to try to uh, bring the PO to the understanding that actually agreements that are made with the stakeholders need to be also made with the team as they are the ones directly affected by those agreements. Uh, what, what ideas do you have there? So, well, the, the two approaches that I use, and I did use them in that context, you know, number one is about making sure in things like sprint ret retrospectives that as scrum masters were asking very open, powerful questions and that we're not afraid to have some silence while people really grapple with questions they might find uncomfortable or difficult to answer. Um, so that was that was one strategy that I found really helpful just to to open that up and sort of say, so what do we know about how this situation arose and having that quiet while people are thinking? But then the other thing is around actually without pointing the finger in this context at the PO or anybody in particular, just again, opening the question and asking them to think forward and think, OK, so. Let's play out an alternative possible outcome from what we've experienced. So if that conversation had happened with the team, how might the outcome have been different? So actually trying to a scrum master support the team with modelling alternative scenarios, either for what did happen or then moving it future focus to say, so in the future, if we're faced with a similar scenario, How could we approach that differently? Now, in the situation I've described, the product owner did actually step up and admit failure, which was, uh, you know, great credit to them. And it was also, I think, very motivating for the team to see that there was that psychological safety to do that. However, to actually then get everybody on board rather than blaming just one person, re reconverge as a team and problem solve as a whole team okay so in this instance it was due to this lack of communication from the product owner so in the future as a team how can we address this and that flowed flows really nicely into retroactions as possible steps forward absolutely great story and great tips and now we turn our attention to the greatest perhaps the best product owner you've ever worked with Susanna How did that product owner uh, act and what did it look like to work with that product owner? Well, this product owner I have in mind, I have the great joy to work with them in my current role. And honestly, they are just phenomenal. Um, the, the thing that makes them such a good, well, not just a good PO, a great PO, is they are unapologetically, relentlessly focused on user experience and delivering great user experiences and high product value. Um, and that word value is at the very core of everything that they do. So this PO will be on a call and pretty much every conversation I ever hear them having with anybody, at some point they will bring it back to what is the value we're driving here. So that is brilliant because they are constantly using the experience of the users of the product as the guiding star for what needs to be happening in the development and deployment of product. And that is a dichotomy that I see very um, often in teams where teams can get so engrossed in the coding and the development and their kind of immediate sphere of reference that they actually forget what they're doing it for in the first place. And it was the fact that this product owner is so fantastic in terms of being very engaging with stakeholders, excellent at building relationships, superb at um, helping team members feel included and valued and, you know, is always very upbeat and engaging on calls. 
all of that, in addition to this uh, focus on value, meant that he and I have been able to have a fantastic collaboration on um, an, a, an approach that I have designed and facilitated with many teams called Metrics and Chill. And this approach is focused. It's almost like a ways of working uh, that is focused on using metrics and how teams use metrics to understand their own value that they drive. And this PO, because he is so focused on that value and user experience, it's meant that not only have we been able to work as a team on the day to day product stuff you would expect, but he has been a key ally and a key bridge to influencing very, very senior stakeholders in the organization to know about the work that the team is doing, you know, almost like uh, as a showcase for the team beyond what stakeholders would see in a sprint review. So through metrics and chill, you know, I, I guide teams through understanding what metrics have they used in the past to understand the value they drive, what metrics could they use, them crafting what is called a basket of measures. So again, him and I working together. So him as PO, being a great PO and me as scrum master to actually work with the team so that they can actually decide what metrics are important for them to articulate their value. That has then led into some very uh, high organizational. Um, when I say high, I don't mean in terms of hierarchy. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, multiple people involved looking at financial proxies for outcomes in terms of the value that teams drive. And this is a brand new innovative approach that has never been used before in our organization. And I can confidently say that it would not have developed as quickly as it had, had I as Scrum Master not had that real confidence in that really brilliant product owner. Absolutely. Uh, if you do have a write-up on that, please do send the link. Uh, if not, it would be lovely to have a write-up on that uh, metrics and chill approach that you just described. It sounds to me that uh, one of the aspects in, in this case of a great product owner is, of course, first, they are very focused on what they want to achieve. And that might be, in this case, user experience or it might be something else. But then that they work together with the Scrum Master, that, that you and the product owner actually form a, a dynamic duo, right? So almost like speaking the same language, but from different perspectives. Is that how you see it? Absolutely. And that example I just gave, um, I mean, my, my immediate coaching team laugh, laugh at me sometimes. I've got a brilliant, brilliant coaching team at work um, and they'll often hear me refer to what I call, you know, the, the flow state. I mean, that's a very commonly um, held concept, isn't it, about when you know you're working in a high performing team, you just have that flow state, you know, things just it's like magic, right? You know, things just happen. You kind of just know how the other person is going to run with something um, like a, like a relay race right and with this product owner i described it absolutely is like that with the flow state you know that absolute trust and confidence both ways you know he knows that i'm going to do what i've promised likewise i know he's going to do what he promised so again that enables me to turn up in my role with that confidence that when i'm engaging with uh, the the development team that the product owner is rooting for me as well and and wants me to be able to do a good job of what i'm there to do yeah absolutely a great and inspiring story of collaboration between the product owner and the scrum master which of course uh, in the end we need to work together with the product owner to help the team succeed that was a great story thank you for sharing that Susanna unfortunately we're getting close to the end but before we do go where can people find out more about you and the work that you're doing uh, well, the, the best places uh, that people can find out about my work are on LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn as Susanna Chambers. Um, my profile picture might confuse some people because it's uh, it's a photograph of me with my double bass that I play as a professional musician. But don't be fooled. I am really a scrum master. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, LinkedIn, uh, I put loads of stuff on there about my work as, as a scrum master and agile coach. Um, and then also, if people want to check me out on Twitter, I'm on there as at Susanna Chambs, C-H-A-M-B-S, one. Absolutely. We'll put the link on the show notes so that uh, people can easily uh, connect with uh, Susanna and uh, share your appreciation for the stories she shared with us this week. Susanna, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. Thank you for inviting me, Vasco. It's been great. Take care. 
one more week of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast is over. But there's a lot more we have to share. We have developed our own membership site where you find a community of active and engaged Scrum Masters. In this site, you get access to exclusive content and get to interact with us, your podcast hosts, as well as the best Scrum Masters in the world. Join us at scrummastertoolbox.com forward slash podcast and keep this podcast free of advertising. See you next week for one more week full of Scrum Master tips and tricks. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. 